So Cindy read John 14, 1 to 7. It's one of the stories that we read as part of our uh, VBS time last week. It's one of my favorite passages. I actually use it a lot at funerals. You've probably heard me talk about it at least once. But I've always focused on the idea of the many rooms and Jesus preparing a place for us. We haven't really had a chance to talk about what comes next. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. This text has historically raised a controversial question. Is Christianity the only way to God? What about people of other faith traditions? What about members of my family who find no interest in Christianity? What about my Islamic friend Camille or my rabbi friend Daniel? Wasn't there a promise to the Jews before Christians? Are they all cut off from God? That's a big question. But I don't think that's what this text means. There's a tradition in the Christian church that treats Christian faith as the great determiner of who is in and who is out with God. For them, the purpose of church is to persuade others to become like us. For just as we have professed faith in Jesus Christ, they too must profess faith in Jesus. Not that faith might bring them comfort and hope, teach love and compassion, help us to live and learn well together, but because this is the only way to become right with God and to avoid punishment. No one comes to the Father except through Jesus. What does that mean? Do you have to worship Jesus Christ to find salvation? Or is there something more? Whenever I ask that question, I get a variety of responses, whether it's with children, youth, or adults. Someone will always ask, well, what about children born on some remote island without much contact? Are they just out of luck due to the circumstances of their birth? That doesn't sound like a gracious and loving God. There will be children born in Indonesia today, the largest Muslim country in the world. We have to be honest that the chance of such a child professing faith in Jesus is much less than a child who happens to be born in a hospital named St. Luke's or St. Francis or Presbyterian. Does that seem just? Or gracious. Someone will inevitably point out that knowing Jesus as the way to eternal life really reduces the importance of life in this world, because this world only ends up serving as an audition ground for the more important life to come. And if you happen to find Jesus, follow Jesus, worship and say the right prayer, then you win, and if not, you lose. Does that sound right? And it raises questions about the very nature of God. If God condemns what will no doubt be the majority of the human family over time, how is that loving? And how does that connect with what we say to be true that all are God's beloved children? No one comes to the Father except through me. It sounds like Christians are in and everyone else is out. It sounds like Jesus is telling his followers that Muslims are excluded, that Hindus are cut off, that Native American spiritualists are lost, that Jews have no part. And for that matter, your cousin Eddie, who says he doesn't believe in God, is facing eternal consequences for his spiritual apathy. I don't think that's what these words in the Gospel of John mean. As always, context is important. This was about a debate within Judaism about the significance of Jesus. If you remember, John's gospel is written anywhere from 100 to 150 years after Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John's really trying to both teach the Jewish community and the new Christian community and the Roman Greek community that want nothing to do with any of He's trying to sh- give something to everybody. This text is an affirmation that in Jesus, we see God's love that does not let us go. A love that prepares a place for us with God. You don't have to be afraid because the love of God has come to you. It says we come to the Father through Jesus. 
not through belief in Jesus. And that's different. My belief does not save me. Jesus saves me. When I used to live down south, I'd often get asked by folks, Now, darling, when were you saved? That's my southern lady impersonation, in case you didn't guess it. <laughs> Bless your heart. And my response was always, around 30 AD on a hill called Golgotha outside Jerusalem. And it always caused people to give me weird looks because they want something like, well, it was July 12th at a camp and, and I gave my life to Christ by standing up and saying a prayer. They want that specific time when I saved me. But my answer is based on the fact that my belief, my action, my saying some special prayer on a certain day is not what affords me salvation. The life, death, and resurrection of Jesus does that. One of my favorite series of books is the Chronicles of Narnia. Anyone read the Chronicles of Narnia, all of them? So there's a scene in the last book, the last battle, in which a Kalerman soldier who has worshipped Tash all his life ends up going into the stable through this door and basically into the afterlife, so to speak. And he realizes he's now in a heaven sort of place, and he's looking for Tash. He's worshipped this bird-like God, Tash, for all his life, all the good he did, all the devotion he gave. He wants to see Tash face to face. He enters deeper into this realm, and there he sees the great lion, Aslan. Always the kind of nemesis God to Tash, and realizes, oh no, I was wrong. My entire life, I was wrong and I will be eternally punished for it. And Aslan welcomes him as a child and says, all the worship you gave to Tash all your life was really worship unto me, for no good thing can be done in the evil thing's name, and no evil thing can be done in a good thing's name. And the soldier bows down and worship Aslan and enters further up, and further in to the glorious kingdom. I like that. Lewis got into a lot of trouble with that from some people, but I like it. So here's what I mean. Jesus reveals that God loves the whole world. God so loved the world. Jesus reveals the love of God that extends to all creation and shows God's desire to redeem all. Jesus died to draw the entire world to himself, as John says elsewhere in his gospel. Jesus shows that you are loved with a love that will not let you go, and there are no limits to that love. But the text does speak of belief. And belief is very important. Jesus says, do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Yes, our belief in God matters. But the word belief is more about trust than some intellectual set of standards that you agree with. Our belief, our trust in God, comforts us, guides us, challenges us, grounds us, calls us, and helps us accept all that God gives. If God loves us, but we don't trust that, we don't receive that, doesn't do us much good. If someone is giving you something, you don't trust that gift, and you turn away saying, I don't think I'm really getting that free vacation cruise, you're not going on that cruise. If you do trust it, you are. You don't control the cruise, you don't get yourself the cruise, but you have to trust if it's real or not. That's what belief is. And that's an important distinction. Our belief does not save us, but it helps us receive that which God does for us. We receive salvation through belief. We don't earn it. We don't get it. We don't claim it. Yet when I trust that the grace of God claims me, two things happen. The first, I don't worry about my salvation anymore. God's taking care of that. Do not let your hearts be troubled. 
You do not need to worry about your salvation. I have prepared a place for you with God. Believe that. Trust that, Jesus says. The second, if Jesus reveals that God's love extends to all people, then that shapes how we see others, particularly others who do not share our faith in Jesus. What I'm saying is that this passage is not about creating those who are in and those who are out. Creating those who are in and those who are out is not actually a Christian teaching. The need to determine who is in and who is out is a more common human tendency. I think it's because we like clear lines. And we're more comfortable with boxes and categories we can put ourselves and everyone else in. We divide people. Who's in, who's out, who's righteous, who's not, who has a place at the table, and who's outside knocking on the door with bloody knuckles but knowing they're never getting in and having a seat there. It starts young. Tree houses that say no girls allowed. Club houses that say girls rule, boys drool. (laughs) It's true. But it continues. Whites only. Wear this Star of David on your clothes. If you can't sign this pledge and belief statement, you can't work here. If you don't fit into these parameters, you can't get married, can't serve in the church, can't play on a sports team. And I hear more and more about a national divorce. Blue states over there, red states over here, and you can decide which is the real America. It's in our laws and in our language, those big city elitists the woke mob, the MAGA mob, the wackos in California or Florida or Texas. We are constantly creating us and them who's in, who's out, who's worthy, who isn't. It's not our most mature practice, and it's not a Christian perspective. In our nation, we could use some maturity and perspective. All of us are caught up in the national conversation. It's political, it's cultural, it's moral, it's a spiritual conversation, and it's lacking some maturity and perspective. And maybe it shouldn't surprise us. Let me tell you something about the Christian faith in my life. I never live up to it. Christian faith is always bigger than I am. Every week I need our prayer of confession, for I've not yet become the person God wants me to be. And that's true for me, and true for you. But it's not only true for us as individuals, it's true for us as communities. It's true for the church, this church. It's true for nations, this nation, our nation. So of course our trust in Jesus Christ what times cause us to see the nation as lacking some maturity and perspective. And this is never more the case than when we are afraid. Anti-Semitic statements and propaganda is on the rise. There's continued harmful rhetoric directed at people because of their faith, their gender, their nationality, their political affiliation. We are suspicious of others not because of the content of their character, but because of their nationality, sexuality, even their religion. We can't quite figure ourselves out. We seem to be struggling to discern our values, but we seem to think if we can just identify those who don't belong, That will save us. Historically, we've tried that. Over and over again, it's been tried. If we just don't have them anymore, we'll be okay. It was all too real last April in Berlin, seeing the evidence of that. Germany was struggling after the First World War. The economy was in shambles. There was no military, a loss of national pride. So Adolf Hitler found a scapegoat a group to direct everyone's anger and anxiety. If we just got rid of them, we would be great again. And they tried. I wish I could say he was the first, but he actually learned how to do it and how to do it well from right here in America and the rest of Europe. Why? Because we seem to think if we can justify, just just identify those who don't belong, that will save us. It's never worse, not here, not in Germany or South Africa or Northern Ireland or anywhere else. 
but we keep trying it. We keep doing it. But it's not Christian. Sometimes we need a word to remind us of our higher values. This is particularly true when we are afraid. Have you ever heard of Fred Korematsu? Anyone ever heard of Fred Korematsu? I didn't until recently. Mr. Korematsu was a Japanese-American and a Presbyterian elder in the First Presbyterian Church of Oakland, California. On February 19, 1942, there was a presidential executive order that declared Fred Korematsu and all Japanese-American citizens were a threat to national security. As a nation, we were afraid, much like we are today. Mr. Korematsu fought this executive order all the way to the Supreme Court. He insisted that being of Japanese heritage was not a justified reason to place him in a prison camp. He lost his case before the Supreme Court. Let that sink in. Our highest court said your ethnicity and nationality are reason enough to strip you of your rights and imprison you if we are scared. Highest court. We're scared. We think you're the problem. We can put you away. All while the same thing was happening in Germany. And we act like the holy saviors of the world. Funny how that works. We are not our best selves when we're scared. Individuals or courts or nations. Mr. Korematsu may have lost his case, but he is remembered because even in a season of fear, he reminded us of our higher values. And that's something he learned in church. I don't believe this text says that God favors some and rejects others, but exactly the opposite. Jesus is the reason we know God loves all people. The love of God extends to all people. To God, we are all family. And Jesus has prepared a place for us, for all, with God. The challenge, the unending challenge, is for Christian people to remember and to live like we are all family. It's so difficult, but it's so important. In February of 1997, Madeleine Albright, who had just been sworn in as Secretary of State, learned something her parents never told her. She learned it from a Washington Post journalist that she was Jewish. She also learned that 12 members of her family had perished during the Holocaust. In July that same year, a few months later, Secretary Albright traveled to what was then the Czech Republic. While there, she visited the Pinka Synagogue in Prague. She described it this way. Entering, you observe what appears to be fine wallpaper covering the wall. But as you get closer, you see that the pattern is actually made of neat black writing, listing the 77,000 Czech Jews who died in the Holocaust. The Jewish officials accompanying me pointed out the names of Arnost and Olga Korbel. They were her grandparents. She wrote, I had not foreseen that I would start visualizing my grandparents in striped concentration camp uniforms, seeing their hollow faces staring back at me. I thought about how they must have suffered, their struggle to survive the torture of their last hours. She then said, a year earlier I visited the synagogue. It looked the same now as it had then. It was I who changed. What would happen if we realized that the names out there are the names of our family, the names of the victim of gun violence? Those are our family, our grandchildren. The names of the refugees who die at sea, our family. The names of the homeless veterans on our streets, our family. Would it change how you thought about it? If you looked at the paper and you read the list of those who died at sea on a refugee ship and you saw, oh my gosh, that's my cousin. 
If you saw Harrisburg, you said, oh my gosh, that name, that's my grandchild. If you looked at the list of those killed in a mass shooting at a school and you saw, that was my brother, that teacher, that was my father, would it change how you thought about what was happening in the world if every time you looked at the paper, the latest tragedy, you realized that was your brother, your sister, your grandparent, your child, your grandchild? Would you think about it differently? Or would you keep going on, ignoring it like day to day, this is just what happens in our world? Would we live differently if we remembered we are all family? We live in a culture where it's easy to create those who are in and those who are out. Who has a seat at the table and who doesn't? When our salvation comes, and it's surely coming, when we see the truth that is the truth, we will discover that there is a wall in the heart of God, and written there is the name of every person. Every person you meet. And we will finally discover and know for sure that all along we are all family. They were our family. Jesus has prepared a place with God for you and for all. Believe that in your heart and you will not be troubled. Believe that and maybe we will remember that we are all family. And maybe, just maybe, we will not be quite so afraid. Let us pray together. God of love, we thank you that your love does not let us go, that your love is for all, that our names are written on your heart, and resurrection calls our name. Love calls our name. You call our name. Help us to live into that love, and to love as you have loved us, as family. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.